make some excuses. Okay, now let's try this again. Hold your Bibles up. All right, let's wave them around. Isn't it good to see the Word of God in the house of God? Amen. This week has been yet another in the adventure of monsoon season of Indiana. I, I literally could not believe that we are now in the middle of July and I think there's only been five days of sunshine since the first since the first of May. It's just insane how much rain we've got. And the last two days in particular have just been crazy. Like Friday, I drove down to Indianapolis. Um, there was a couple that I'm doing their wedding over Labor Day weekend. And they live down in Indianapolis. It's one of Jamie's good friends. So I had plans to meet with them. And then uh, my brother-in-law, uh, who also was without his wife, we decided we'd get together and we decided we were going to play golf. And we had this great idea. Hey, you know what? We're going to be down there. Let's play golf. Now, this is down in Indianapolis. The weather forecast was sunny, which meant that was a free ride for me to take the Jeep because whenever I see it's sunny, I'm just like, hey, we're going to just go ahead and enjoy the open air. It was open air until number six. If you know, don't know golf, there are 18 holes. I was playing number six. I get there to number six, and we notice we are the only golfers on this course. And then we look, and we see it's really, really dark. And we're thinking to ourselves, ha, huh, this, this isn't good. So we go on, we play number six, number seven shows up. We hit our shots, and we're walking around right there in the beautiful nature area. All of a sudden, I looked up, I go, wow, I have never seen clouds that had different colors like that before. And we both just stood there for just a few minutes, we're looking up, wow. And then we noticed these clouds were really, really low to the ground, like more low than what I've ever seen clouds. I'm like, man, Ty, isn't that awesome? Those clouds are really low. He's like, yeah, it's really cool. He goes, should we keep playing? I'm like, yeah, why not? And all of a sudden they start slowly making a, a, a circle and at that point we go I, I don't think that's good <laughs> so we took we took some tees and we put them down where our balls were picked our balls up and went back to the uh, clubhouse because we're, we're kind of concerned two seconds after going into the clubhouse torrential downpour began for like 45 minutes and the rain finally let up and we're going, well, let's just go back out and play. It, it was all underwater. Like it had rained so much that it was all underwater. So we're like, okay, well, forget that. And we said, well, here's what we're, go we're going to do. We're just going to pick our balls up. We're going to go back and we're going to go out to dinner. I get back to my Jeep and <laughs> I, had the, I have a tarp that I put on top. It was dry on the seats, thankfully. But under the seats on the floorboards, I had about four inches of standing water. So that was fun. And uh, so anyway, go home. Saturday, I get a call. Hey, it's my buddy. He goes, do you, you want to play golf? I'm thinking to myself, what I didn't get yesterday, I can go because I'm back. I can do this. Two o'clock. Now, again, me being amateur weather guy, looks up on the, on the phone, says, hey, it's supposed to be sunny. Jeep driving. It's 1.30. Now, if you all don't know what was taking place yesterday, I don't know where you were. 1.30, I'm driving. I go, it's really dark at Columbia City, just north of Columbia City. And I keep driving. And people are like honking at me. Idiot, you got your hood off. So I finally put the roof back on. No joke, I pull in to the golf course at 2.05. And I can't get out of the Jeep because it's just torrential downpour again. I have come to the conclusion that I am cursed and my golfing career is officially over because that was the second storm. And then to add insult to injury, I'm driving home and as I'm driving back out west, it's like 7, 715, it's pitch black again in Columbia City, which I also believe Columbia City is cursed, throwing that out there. I'm like the only car on the road as buckets of water are going against me, which again was just a miserable experience. Now I wasn't aware of what took place in the morning. Joe, JR, did you guys survive the weather? See, that's why I should have gone with them. But the, the bottom line is, it's not a matter of whether the storm was going to happen. It's just when, because in Indiana we have learned something. Don't expect it to be sunny for long. It's going to rain. 
And that's what I wanted to talk about today because it's not a matter of if a storm is going to come in our lives. It's a matter of when is the storm going to come in our life. Every one of us is going to experience a storm in their life at some point. It's not a matter of if, but when. Life is like this summer. You have a plan. You think you're going to, like me, get some sunshine. You think you're going to go to the lake. You think you're going to go to the pool. You think you're going to play some golf. But how many know your life, you can make some plans, but the best laid plans sometimes don't go the way you thought it would. Sometimes storms come. Now I want to say this because the title of what I'm going to be sharing is preparing for the storm. If you're writing notes, that's what it is. We're preparing for the storm. But I want to say something about storms before we get into preparing for them. Because storms are inevitable and storms are not totally all bad. Let me share some things about storms real quick. Number one, in Isaiah chapter 44 verse 3 it says this, For I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Storms aren't bad because they provide water for the thirsty. Our natural land needs water. Vegetation needs water. What is water? Water is life. Storms carry with them life. There might be some negative effects of a storm. If you've had to go out and clean up your backyard, I know Joe sent us pictures of the pool. Right after our baptism, his pool turned into a moat. I mean, it was just, it was awful. It was clear when we were there. It was a color that was unrecognizable to me when you sent me the pictures. What is that? That's the after effects of a storm. It can cause damage, but storms do carry with them life. Not only do storms carry life, storms bring about change. If you've ever seen sometimes on the Weather Channel when those tropical storms hit, I think it, one of the fascinating plants that exists is the palm tree. Number one, I just get happy seeing a palm tree. How many have ever just had that where you just look at a palm tree and go, I feel happier because I'm in a tropical place. But palm trees are unique because they adapt to the weather. So sometimes you'll see palm trees that are like kind of weird shaped because they want to grow straight up but they have to adapt. So some of them are tilted, some of them go in different directions. Why? Because storms bring about change. Not only do we see that with palm trees, but we see it in the fall in particular. Where dead leaves, when a storm comes, that were hanging on a tree, now get swept away. It changes the way things look. In Jeremiah chapter 15 verse 19 it says this, extract the precious from the worthless. Leaves in the fall are beautiful to look at. They're gorgeous, gold, brown, etc. But if those leaves were to stay on the tree, they would suck life out of the tree in the winter. They have to be swept away in order for the tree to maintain. And when it says extract the precious from the worthless, sometimes we hear that verse and we go, well, it, it deals with those people you don't like. It deals with those people you can't stand. So you have to find something in those worthless people that you can extract. No, that's a real judgmental spirit. I don't believe that's what it, it, it means at all. I believe that you have to save the precious things in life from the worthless. What I mean by that is, um, I apologize. What I mean by that is, there are a lot of things that look good on the peripheral, but when a storm comes, it shows you what's really important, where life really matters. You follow with me on that? And number three, I wrote this down. Storms heighten your senses. I don't know about you all, when I was out on that golf course with my brother-in-law, when that got really dark and the circle started to happen, Side note, a funnel cloud did touch down like a mile north of where we were, so we were, it was really fun. But when that was taking place, how many have ever been around a storm and you feel different? You know what I'm saying? Y your, your heart rate kind of increases. Your body feels different. It's a natural reaction. Now, I'm watching my wife freak out. She does not like storms at all. I love them. I, I live for storms. She, she's not, I'll talk more about her later. I'll pick on her in a minute. But look at what it says over in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, look it up for me, in uh, chapter 16, 
1 Corinthians chapter 16. And we're going to look at just verse 13 real quick. It says this, Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men and be strong. Be on the alert. Now, we talk about hind senses. We have two little dogs, Lila and Willow. I've been stuck with just those two dogs by myself for the last couple of days. And let me tell you what those little dogs do when the storm starts to... They are all over the map. They're... I put them in the, the little room that we put them in because I just got tired of them running around on me. I'm like, girls, calm down. I finally put them in the room. You know what they start doing? They start jumping against the door. Just throwing themselves in. I was like, come on. So I took them back out again. You know, I was hoping they'd be like scared and they'd hide. No, no, no. They just keep jumping on me like I should do something about it. I can't do anything about the storm. Animals have that natural instinct. How many have ever been outside and all of a sudden you see all the birds start flying away or, or you see something? You go, oh, it's, it's not going to be good here in a minute. That's because animals have the same thing. It heightens their, their senses. But... What I'm talking about is not the natural storm of weather. I'm talking about spiritually with storms. I mentioned that they bring life and that they, that they carry with them life and that they cause things to change. But when a storm is getting ready to happen, spiritually, we need to be in tune as well. Just as it says there in 1 Corinthians, be on the alert and stand firm in your faith. Y'all, when you start feeling something that seems a little different, be on the alert. Why? Because so often in life, there is a fear associated with storms. See a storm front coming in, it causes fear. Naturally, you go, man, something feels different spiritually. There's a fear that comes with it of the unknown, a fear of damage, a fear of destruction. This is why we have the instinct in the natural. When we feel a storm coming, we, we have those, those instincts. But the instinct in us is not to run around or throw ourselves into the doors like a dog or to fly away like a bird. No, the instinct that we feel when a storm is coming is for us to prepare. How many know when you see that there's a storm that's moving in and you hear the little alert on the radio or you see the thing on the TV, what is that telling you? We need to prepare for the storm. And the same is true spiritually. When there's a feeling of change, we must get ourselves prepared for what's going to happen. Not in fear, but in an anticipation. Number one, we need to get ready for the storm. Here's how we prepare. The storm is coming. I want you to hear that. A storm spiritually is coming. And we need to get prepared. So what, number one, how do we get prepared? Safe location. We need to have a safe location. My mom, about 7.15, she calls me. How is it? I said, well, I'm driving right now. Why are you driving? I said, well, I was trying to play golf and it didn't happen. And, and, and so I'm coming back home. She goes, well, it looks terrible in Warsaw. Well, I'm in Columbia City right now and it looks pretty bad here too. Well, let me know when you get in. You're driving in this letter. So my mother, and I have now married someone just like this, has a tremendous fear of storms. When we were a kid, if it got cloudy out, all right, get your sleeping bags, go in the hallway. We were like just half our life was spent in a fallout shelter type setting as a kid. That was, that was life growing up with Terry. I mean, that was just how it was going to be. We were just locked into that closet, shutting all the doors, get your sleeping bags. Here we go. Why? Because you had to be in a safe location. How many ever learned that when you were growing up? When a storm comes, if there's going to be a tornado watch or if there's a major th thunderstorm coming through, be in a place where what? There's no glass, there's no windows, there's no mirrors, there's nothing that can harm you. Make sure you're around where there's like door jams and things because they're structural. I may know what I'm talking about. Safe location. Isaiah chapter 4 verse 6 says that God is our shelter in the time of storm. How? How is He our shelter? Where do we go? Are we to hide? 
Like when we were kids, I mean, that was kind of what we did. We all went to that area. How many have a place in your house that you go to? I, <laughs> I got to share this. I was down here. I was down for a service, and it was a Sunday night, and there were storms that were moving through. This was last summer. And Dominic and Jamie were together at home. And a storm front was coming in. And I got a picture. They had gone to the one, our house is small anyway, but there's not a lot of places that aren't windows. And Jamie has found the safest place to be in the storm is in our closet. So I've got this picture of my child with like barricade of blankets and her just all bundled up in the closet. We're here. Well, I'm glad to know you're safe. And if anything else happens, you'll be a pile of clothing to keep you protected. I don't know what's going to happen, but I get a kick out of it. We're not to hide, but we are to find shelter. Spiritually, we're not to hide, we're to find shelter. What is shelter? Shelter is a place that you go in order to be free from harm. Let me make it a little bit more practical. Look over in the book of Matthew. Chapter 5. I'm going to tell you how we want to get hunkered down. Matthew chapter 5 verse 30. Jesus said this. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. You say, well, what does that have to do with shelter? If a shelter is a place that you're going to get out of harm's way, what can harm us spiritually? Temptation. Sin. Those are the things that cause us the most harm. When we sin against God, we're harming ourselves. Now, listen, I don't want us to have a whole church of amputees. So I'm not saying to literally go out there and cut off your right arm or whatever's causing you to stumble. But how many know there is an importance? If a spiritual storm is coming and it's going to shake us up, it's important we get to a place that we desire to remove the temptations in our life. Remove those things that cause you to stumble. Remove those things that cause you to slip away from God. One of the things that we, we found in our family, it's a work in progress. I'm sharing this not as a completion, but as something that we are desiring to work for. How many know technology, I shared it earlier, can be wonderful. The fact that a church is using our Bible studies on Wednesday night at their church is wonderful. Technology carries a lot of things. I have a phone, I don't know where I put it, it's over there. I used to make fun of people that carried the big smartphones until I started to realize how wonderful they were. For a person like me that has ADD, you need to keep everything in one place. It's wonderful. It's all right there. But we have found something. Technology, where it can be blessing, can also be curse. And it can separate relational things. Because everybody can be doing their smartphones and their iPads and their video games. And then there's no connection. And we've desired that we're going to try to find times where we have no technology time in the house. Where we just turn off the TV, put the phones away, take away all technology, and just hang out. That's something that we prioritize, and that's a shelter. Same thing is true with God. I was meeting with a couple yesterday, and the statement was made, well, we want to have faith. We want to have a relationship, and that is a part of our relationship with the Lord in our marriage relationship in the future. But with work, it's just so busy, and, and there's just so much stuff that we don't have time. Y'all prioritize the time with God. Even if it's just for a few minutes, get out a devotional. Spend some time in prayer. Remove the things that are there that are keeping you from God. Just like we try to avoid windows and mirrors and things that damage us, take out the TVs, take out the things that cause you distraction, take out the drinks, take out the whatever. Whatever it is that's separating you from a, lot, a walk with God, remove those temptations and allow your home to be a shelter. Safe location. 
Here's number two. When I was over at my grandmother's house, we had to go through the home after she passed away. And there was a lot of things. Now, if you did not know this about my grandfather, I'm just going to share something with you. There was no human being that was more prepared in life for any situation than my grandfather. Like any building he built, he made sure there was a bathroom in it, a shower in it, a place where you could put stuff in for a kitchen. Because if anything happened where there was another Great Depression, he wanted to be able to move into his garage. He wanted to be able to move. His house has sections where there was areas that could be used where if in fact there was a depression, his family could move in and there'd be three different areas where they'd have their own living space. The man was prepared beyond words. But he also really was over prepared some places because we found like a thousand flashlights. Because if there was a storm, we couldn't have to look for the flashlight. He had a flashlight not in every room, in every part of the room. Like if, it was, if it, there was a blackout and you were sitting on the couch, right next to the couch there would be a flashlight. Now you might not have noticed it because he would spray paint them so they would match the decor. It was insane. But that's what number two is. Number two is have your own light. If a storm comes, you can't rely on the lights at the house anymore. You have to be able to have a flashlight. You have to be able to have a candle. Something that you can carry yourself as your own individual light. What does that mean? Because in our faith, we must be able to have a light that is independent of other stuff. Look at what it says in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. God desires all men to be saved and all men to come to the knowledge of the truth. What is that? God's desire is for all of us to have salvation. And God's desire is for all of us to have the knowledge of the truth. Not just for some of us to have the knowledge and some of us to have salvation so that others can be inspired. No, he doesn't want us to be just inspired. He wants us to find it for ourselves. Work out your own faith in fear and trembling. We cannot put our faith in God as a dependent thing. What do I mean by that? We can't put our faith in God saying, I believe in God as long as this church stands. I believe in God if my needs are met. I believe in God because my parents did. I believe in God because, man, I was really inspired by Bishop. No. It's got to be an independent thing. I believe in God because I know what he's done in my heart. I trust in God because I have worked out my own salvation. I'm not saved because Phil Pano was saved. I'm not saved because Paul Pano was saved. I'm saved because Anthony Pano came to the place of going, I want to have a relationship with God. I hope you hear what I'm saying. We are to all individually have our own light. It's a relationship. Tonight, I've... We've, we started something throughout the summer. We said every Sunday night, we're going to have communion. We're going to have communion every Sunday is what we said. It, this evening, it's going to be tonight. I had a plan. 90% of my ministry team got my plan. Sorry, Julie. I'm changing it anyway. I'm going to do something tonight with communion that I've never done really before. Some of it's going to look familiar, but we're going to do some, things a little bit different because I believe... And I want you to hear this. Please, I'm not saying this is hyperbole. Be here tonight. Because I believe God gave me a revelation yesterday in the midst of talking with some people. I believe God gave me a revelation that is relating to our communion tonight. Let me just share this as just a little sidebar. You know what communion is. It's not just a sacrament that we take as a part of a service. Jesus, very practically, was meeting with the people he was closest with for dinner. How many have ever had close people, family or friends, that you've had dinner with? God desires us to be like that with him. That's not how we're born into this world because of sin nature. 
But tonight I'm going to talk about what it is to reconnect in a relational way with God. And I really hope that you'll be here tonight for communion, not just to take the communion as a sacrament, but to experience communion with God on a different level. I really believe God's given me a word for this tonight. It was not something I was expecting. I was preparing more for this lesson than I was for what I was going to do tonight. But just yesterday in the night season, God really quickened me that some of the words that I was saying in passing to a couple, he showed me a greater truth out of, and I'm going to share that with us tonight. But that's this evening. Let me get back to this. We must find our own light because number three, not only do we need to find a, have a safe location, not only do we have to have our own light, number three, we must be on a firm foundation. Why is it that every time that we see a major storm hit, we hear tragedy in trailer parks? You, know, you see that? It's because those homes are most greatly affected because they have such little foundation. I said this to, to a couple yesterday. It's great to think that you're going to live on a beach because you have this great idea that if you live on a beach, it's going to be sunny and perfect all the time. But how many know storms come and hit the beach just as much as they do anywhere else? And if you don't expect those storms to come and you don't put a real foundation in, that beach house is going to get swept away. That's why those homes cost so much to build because they have to really build them in a way to prepare for the storm. Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 through 27, Jesus gives us that parable. The man who built on the sand, his house got swept away. But he who builds his house on the rock, that when the storm comes and the waves come crashing down, that house will stand. We must build on the rock. We must have a foundation of faith. Don't let it be where you've built your faith in God as a grass hut. Be the smart piggy that used some bricks. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Take the time to really get to know God. Take the time to get into his word. Don't just be a paper thin Christian that you go, hey, I'm a Christian now. I'm excited. I'm ready to serve him. But you never get into his word. You never spend time in prayer. You never spend time in devotional. Why? Because when the storms come, that faith whew, washed away. The people that preach the prosperity doctrine, a lot of them get shaken up because they go, hey, I'm going to be a Christian now and I'm going to drive myself a brand new Jaguar and I'm going to have a mansion. Well, then what happens when you lose your job? Well, God must not be real because they never took the time to really get into God's word. I'm not saying God doesn't prosper. Don't get lost in that. Hear what I'm saying. Take the time to dig in to God's word. Take the time to dig in with prayer. When we do that, then when the storms come, you can go, you know what? I'm standing on God's word. I'm not going to be shaken. A storm is coming to the United States. Do not fear it. Embrace it. The children of Israel were captives in Egypt and they all had to go into their safe house because a storm was coming. It was the death angel. Don't fear the death angel like the Egyptians or like the children of Israel. Watch it pass over because it's going to bring a change that slaves are going to be set free. God's going to set us free. Whatever God's done, in your, whatever's gone on in your life, that storm that's coming, don't be afraid of it. Sit in that house of shelter expecting there to be freedom at the end of the day. A storm is coming to the United States of America. I believe it with all my heart. Do not fear it. Long for it. Why? Well, there were three guys. Their names were Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and there was a storm that was coming in their life and it led to them getting put right in the middle of it a fiery furnace now how many of you all want to stand in the middle of a fiery furnace that's a fearful thing but they didn't fear it they embraced it they longed for it because why there were three men that got put into the furnace but there were four that were walking around in the midst of the storm, 
there's Jesus. The storm's coming to our country. I believe it. I believe the signs are there. I think we feel it. And we get all fearful about what's happening in the world around us. Don't be. Have your safe location that you've removed the temptations that the enemy could snare you with. Have your own light. Work out your faith with fear and trembling. Don't make your faith reliant on someone or something else. Put it in God. And build your foundation by digging into God's word through prayer. Because then when the storm comes, you will not be a slave any longer. When the storm comes, you will not be there alone because Jesus is in the midst of that storm. And when it comes, it will refine you and you will walk out of it with a testimony that the whole world around will go, wow, this Jesus, he's real, he's alive, and I can see it in you. And there's going to be a whole generation of people that are going to be able to be led to the Lord because of a storm that's going to shake away all the stuff that doesn't matter anymore because this storm will bring life. Can we bow for a word of prayer? Lord God, I thank you so much that we've had this opportunity to be here together today. God, I thank you that while the storms of life have been raging, Lord, both in the weather and in circumstances, God, we know that you are the God of the storm. And Lord, I ask that you would help each and every one of these individuals to search their heart, to free themselves of the things that could cause them harm when the storm hits. Lord, to find a way that their faith will have its own light that shines in the darkness. And Lord, that their foundation will be firmly planted in you so that, Lord, we can see slaves be set free. We can see bondages lifted, Lord God. And we can walk closer to you than we've ever been before. Because that's what you are. You're the God of the storm. Now, Lord, I pray that as we get ready to go our different directions, Lord, that you would bless each and every person, Lord God that you would watch over them. And Lord, please, if you should tarry, bring each person back tonight with an expectation to commune with you tonight, Lord. Not just to take a sacrament, but to truly commune with you tonight. For it's in your name we have prayed.